Welcome to the Centre for Computing History at Cambridge once again, and we're here with uh, another gaming luminary. He's probably been described as that before, Mr. John Hare of Sensible Software and many other projects. So, John, if you can tell us uh, initially a bit about how you got into the industry, what interested you about the industry, etc. Well, I got into the industry uh, back in 1985. I was, uh, at the time, I just finished college. Uh, I actually was out, out of a job, and I was looking to start up with a band. I was playing with my friend Chris from school. We, we told our dads we live in college, we're going to get a van, we're going to tour around, it'll be <laughs> fine. Of course it didn't work out, so I ended up doing shift at Asda instead for a while. And then I was without a job, and uh, Chris got himself a little Spectrum, actually a ZX81, on a, ca a case catalogue. Taught himself to programme, and kept on sending them back every month to three different catalogue companies, because they were free then, to teach himself. Yeah, yeah. And off the back of that, he got himself a job with a local company, being a games programmer. Um, I came to his house one night, we were making some music, and uh, he was struggling with some art that he was trying to do, he couldn't do the art, and I'd done art at college, so I did some, some computer art for the first time, uh, and he put it in the game. The company that had employed him then liked the work I'd done, and then employed me. And so within two or three months, me and Chris were working in the same company. We worked there for eight or nine months, uh, a company called LT Software in, in London, in Essex. Mm -hmm. And then uh, after that, we realised actually they were taking most of the money. So we decided to set up on our own on a government, government enterprise scheme. We set up Sensible Software in March of 1986. And so it's quite uh, similar to Mike uh, Montgomery we were talking to earlier. He was in retail. He was working for Woolworths. Absolutely. He, he taught himself <laughs> programming. Um, so um, what aspect of the games did you yourself do? Were, were you into the computer hardware? Were you just the design? Were you an artist? Or okay. How did you fit into, the, into Sensible Software? Well, Sensible Software, for the first... Quite a lot of years. I mean, we ran it for 13 years from 85 and we sold it in 99. But actually, um, sorry, 86 to 99. But I was the artist and Chris was the programmer. And we were a two-man team. Mm -hmm. um, and we both kind of designed the games between us. Chris did more of the game controls and these kind of things. And I did more of the big world the game was in. And the more that one artist can control. So that kind of went on for a few years. And then Martin Galway, who did our sound for a lot of our games, obviously Martin was a brilliant musician yeah. uh, on the Commodore 64. Martin then joined us as a partner for a year and a half, two years. That didn't really work out, mostly because there wasn't so much sound work to do. Martin started being a lead programmer, which was quite challenging for him. Right. And then he got a great offer to go and work in the States. So he went to the States, which, which, was, which was good for him. And uh, then we went on our next phase, which was more the Amiga and uh, ST phase. And then we kind of the role shifted around a bit. So in 92, I did Sensible Soccer art and, and I did WizKid probably in 93. It was one of my last art I did, those games. Mm -hmm. I didn't do Cannon Fodder. Um, Sensible World of Soccer was based on my art, but I think it was touched up by another, another artist. Um, so I kind of stopped because by then we were taking different roles. Chris was more the technical director. So he led, led, was a lead programmer on some games, but on some of them he was just overseeing the other programmers. And art, we just had other guys doing the art, and I was more controlling creative direction and also the business of the company, so like doing the contracts and everything else. From a technical perspective, bearing in mind I'm not at all technical, no. as Mike would have a lot of fun telling you. Yes, he did. Um, uh, but um, basically, uh, the, main, the first system we wrote for this was a Spectrum, a sensible software, mm -hmm. a game called Twister, which came out before we were officially a company uh, via um, System 3, and then Commodore 64, which had been direct, and then we went to Amiga, which I think was via PC by that stage when right. we were going to Amiga. And it was Amiga ST and Mega Drive because we did all the computers in the 68,000 language. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they were really our main formats. PC was always done by uh, another company, which was separate from us. Right. Um, a company called Wave. I think they were also called AVM. Mm -hmm. They're based up in, in Yorkshire, actually. So they did most of our PC conversions. Uh, uh, Chris also did... Uh, uh, I think it was a SNES version of Sensible Soccer in-house. But in general, we did the 68,000 machines and the Commodore 64 and Spectrum in-house. I think we did one Amstrad version of 3D Tennis. But most of it was then farmed out, all the, all the smaller ones. Yeah. So what uh, you mentioned there, this era of the Mega Drive Amiga across the same platforms, mm -hmm. was that, I'm guessing, one of your favourite eras in Sensible in that period because you were still sort of very heavily involved in all the art and... and and you know, having people do the programming, where maybe after that you stepped up a little bit and took took on programmers uh, to do that, uh, you know, hard work. Um, from my perspective, having never been a programmer, 
I just was happy to work with great programmers. You know, one thing that Sensible was noticeable in the Amiga, <coughs> from a designer's perspective, because I was mainly leading the design by the time we get to the Amiga phase. So, on the Amiga, if you look at Megalomania, Sensible Soccer, Can of Fodder, WizKid, um, my role would have been more to be acting as a creative director, stroke producer in the studio. Mm -hmm. um, and um, <coughs> I did the art, mind you, I did do the art on Sensible Soccer and uh, WizKid <coughs> and Megalomania. But by Cannonfodder, I'd stopped. So uh, I guess that my my role was really just oversee the way that the games were going to make sure that it was directed properly to keep on top of the quality. And yes, certainly the Amiga era was the gold era. Mm -hmm. The Amiga was the golden machine, in, in my opinion, yeah. for us. Um, and when we moved to later on to the 3D machines from '95 onwards, we really struggled on on PlayStation and on uh, PC. Um, not so much on Saturn, but on St PlayStation and PC, which is where we took a three, three um, product deal with Warner. Mm -hmm. We struggled with 3D. The reason being, we stayed on 2D much later than other companies because we were, we were number one for 52 weeks yeah. in three years from 92 mm -hmm. to 95. We're the last company on earth that wanted anything to change. And of course, when eventually we did try and move, we were, we were two years behind everyone on 3D. So that was much more difficult for us. So is that what kind of drove the sale of Sensible Software, the closure of Sensible Software, if you like, that leap to the hardware that didn't work out for you? Was it a, a business decision behind closed doors, or how did that all come about? Well, in '95 we signed a three-product deal with um, Warner, because uh, Renegade, who were the publisher of Sensible Soccer and Sensible World yeah. of Soccer, they, they sold to Warner. And we had to decide, actually, between going with Virgin and going with Renegade. Now, actually, we wanted to go with both of them and keep it going as it was, because we had Virgin with Canon for the series and, and Renegade with the Sensible Soccer series. And it was a really good two ways of getting income, very good companies, both of them. But both of them wanted everything from us. They kind of wanted to buy the other one out, so we had to make a choice. Mm -hmm. And in the end, we chose Warner. And uh, Warner had a bit more reach into, obviously, other media and stuff like that, we thought at the time. Um, but, you know, we, took a, we signed a £3 million deal for three games. There was a Sensible Soccer 98, uh, Sex, Drugs and Rock and Roll, and a game called Have a Nice Day. Mm -hmm. um, Have a Nice Day was on PlayStation, and the other two were on PC. They're all 3D games we'd never done before. Yeah. And, yeah, we got two years into this deal. We'd had a lot of money, and we hadn't produced any games. Mm -hmm. The reason being, because we had to employ so many more programmers. They were weaker programmers. They weren't as good as, like, Chris Chapman, who did Sensible Soccer and Megalomania, or Jules, who did... Can of fodder and sensible golf. They were weaker programmers, mm -hmm. so we couldn't trust them so much. We didn't know that at the time, but the quality of our programming stuff really went down. And, and even Chris was struggling with the 3D stuff on PlayStation, never, never done it before. Mm -hmm. So we ended up with a, with a situation where we, we couldn't deliver games to the quality we used to, which was like the top. We were, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. arguably the top developer in Europe at the time we stopped in Amiga, maybe even in the world. So we were used to being right at the top, and we couldn't, technically, we couldn't get there. So we got to a decision in 98, I think it was. We sat down with a with our bank manager with an accountant and we worked out to Fairly compete. To sit down without. <laughs> we worked out, yeah, exactly. We worked out to compete. We'd need to expand from 20 people to 85 people. Right. Mm -hmm. And then it would be, like, we'd already gone from being in a band, running a band, it was like running a band for which we liked, mm -hmm. to like running an orchestra, which was hard. And then you go, 85 people, that's like running a really big orchestra. Yeah. And we're like, do we really want this? You know, we'd had a lot of money from royalties out of the previous games. <laughs> 13 years a good run. We'd had seven number one games. And we're like, you know what? We set this, this, this company up because we're inspired by bands. We're into like Rush and Gong and Pink Floyd and these kind of bands. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of where our philosophy came from almost. And we didn't really want to be running a big corporation. We yeah. liked small company, great products, lots of royalties coming in, having fun, working hard. And we couldn't really see that. And we didn't really want that middle management layer we'd have needed. So we decided to basically quit while we were ahead. Yeah. Or quit while we were, we were starting to put money back in the company as well. So we decided to look for a purchaser. And luckily, Codemasters were the first company we'd approached because we'd been talking to them about other stuff a few mm -hmm. years beforehand. Mm -hmm. And they said yes. So we, we didn't have to look too hard to find the right company to sell to. Yeah, and, and I guess that's something that didn't obviously just affect you as well. You know, games these days have teams of 170, mm -hmm. 180 people and bigger budgets than Hollywood movies half Absolutely. the time. So it wasn't just sensible software that was struggling with that. And I guess maybe, like you say, your philosophy about starting the company. So, right, let's wrap it up then. Well, you know, if we go back three years before then, when we signed the Warner deal, we would have very happily stayed on the Amiga to qualify to all the Amiga and ST yeah. and Mega Drive fans. We'd have stayed there forever, but we were offered four times more money mm -hmm. to move to PC and 
PlayStation. Yeah. yeah. And we couldn't say no. That was the problem. Mm -hmm. they, no one was willing to back this stuff anymore. They wanted 2D to die and 3D to take over. Yeah. It's very interesting in the last five or six years, especially with all the tablets and stuff, how, how strongly 2D. 2D's come back. But at that time, you couldn't sell a, you couldn't sell a 2D game. No. And then, if you move forward to the end of the 90s, you couldn't even sell an original IP game. No. Because all these companies have been burnt by all these start-up... We were in the dot-com bubble, so a lot of people were starting out developers just spewing rubbish about how good they were and they weren't good they weren't delivering and in the end they lost a lot of money and they backed out entirely and then we got through a long phase of you couldn't sell original IP at all yeah. we were very lucky from in the days sensibles around that everyone wanted to buy original IP games we could always get a deal for our games yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, that really changed around so we had a really really good run and we realised we'd had a good run and it was maybe our time was was up on that and to go and do something else. And we hadn't had a break from working hard for 13 years either. Mm -hmm. So we both wanted like a, you know, yeah. sit a down. Holiday. Yeah.